Thank you very much indeed, Liz, for bringing that passage to life for us. It's fantastic. Uh, please keep that passage open, and we're going to pray together. Father, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for the chance to worship, just as those disciples worshipped you and they encountered you on the lake. And we pray, Lord, that we would learn some lessons from this passage in the Bible, this story, this amazing story of Peter walking on the water. We pray that we'd be able to apply that not just to our own lives, but to um, the church and what you're doing with us as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, great to see you today. Um, hope you're enjoying this weather. It's rather nice you know, to be in the garden a little bit. And I always think faith, um, faith rises when the sun shines. That's something that my boss, my old boss from HV used to say to me all the time. And I think there's something about you know, when the sun comes out, things, things look different. And today we're going to be starting a series on the values of the church. One of the things about values is that um, we don't often talk about them. They're things that are um, they're here, they're in the midst of what we do, but then they're not necessarily things we always articulate. And actually we've, we've come to that place where we say we need to articulate our values so that we can actually um, put them out there, we can begin to think about them, we can begin to process them. And so... Um, uh, just to show how, you know, where it comes from, I asked myself the question when I was thinking about these values, you know, what is it that has made us the church that we are? What is it that makes a church, under the threat of closure that this was in 2004, come back to life and is filled with people, um, sending people all over Tower Hamlets, but it continues to be full? What is it that, um, about this church that in spite of a 30%, maybe 40% turnover each year because of um, the people who come to this church just moving sometimes to different countries, sometimes to different parts of the country, that kind of turnover, that we are still absolutely determined to grow this church year on year? What is it about this church that um, doesn't settle for good relationships and good discipleship, but actually wants us to take a step further and say we want to make disciples who make disciples? What is it about um, our um, giving away of members of the church to other churches in Tower Hamlets, which um, need a fresh start? That's part of what we do as a church. We plant churches. We want to establish new churches, giving away people, giving away money. What is it about that? Why do we do that? These things are because God has given us a passion for aiming high. That is a value that um, we believe is from God, and it's something that just begins to come out of everything that we do. And it's because we've got this value that we want to go beyond what we think might be just um, a little bit ordinary. We want to go beyond just being um, a community of people who gather together um, and kind of encourage each other to something far greater. We want to be a, a community that does something with God that could, be, that could never be done on our own. As I said before, values are the things that you believe are important to you. They're important to the way you live. They're important to the way you work. And they actually determine your priorities. They're the measures as well that you use to see if actually you know, you're living the way you want to live. When we have personal values and we don't live according to them, we feel depressed and discouraged. When we live according to the values we have, things begin to fit into place. So this month, we're going to be unpacking our values. I'm going to draw a little picture, because I like drawing, as you know, um, that is just going to be a little symbol of these values. 
And um, the, this first one is aim high. Let's put a line like that. Then next week, I'm going to be talking about a second value, which is give it away. All about generosity. The third value, which is in this direction. Actually, no, I'll do this one first. It kind of looks like that. Which is enjoy it together. And the fourth value is to bow the knee. Oh gosh, terrible spelling. There. Bow the knee. Four values we're going to be looking at across May. To aim high, which I'm going to be looking at today. To give it away next week. Week after, enjoy it together. And the fourth week is bowing the knee. Four values. And if I was to um, draw a picture of um, aiming high, we might have, um, it's a slightly different one to the passage today, but a mountain. That's a little bit of snow peaks there. And we've got a climber here who is kind of holding on, but he's enjoying it. Uh, he's kind of holding a, what's that called? Um, an ice pick, ice axe, no, an ice pick, but we really kind of do it. He's got a little hat on. So aiming high, that is what we're talking about today. Aim high, give it away, enjoy it together and bow the knee. And just a simple way of a graphic to help you to be able to think it through that anyone can do just on the back of an envelope. Aiming high. And I think this passage in the scriptures sums up much of what aiming high is about. Because in this passage, Peter walks on water. It's fascinating to me that it says um, Jesus walks on the water. That's kind of not surprising for God to walk on the water. To me, it's extraordinary that a human being that wasn't God walked on the water. Peter walked on the water. And walking on the water in this passage kind of involves so much of what Christian discipleship is about. It involves wisdom to discern what God is calling us to do. It involves courage as, um, as, you know, to get out of the boat. It involves that euphoria of walking on water. It involves fear and panic of failing and sinking. It involves relief that Jesus is strong enough to reach down and save us. It involves wonder and adoration um, that Peter ends up worshipping Jesus with. So walking on water is something with God that we could never do on our own. Doing something with God that we could never do on our own. And here's something to remember. If you don't get out of the boat, you'll never walk on water. There's the comfort and security of the boat. And there's the risk of getting out. Comfort versus growth. It's a choice. Where was Jesus? Jesus was walking on the water. And it's only when you take the risk of honoring God and saying yes to him saying, come, and getting out of the boat that you meet Jesus. Because Jesus is there whenever someone takes a step of faith. And Jesus is still looking for followers who are willing to get out of the boat and follow him by walking on water. So at St. Paul's, um, God has called us to aim high, to get out of the boat um, of our kind of comfort and take those steps of faith and aim high, walk towards him. It's about three things today I want to unpack. It's about audacious faith. It's about a relentless optimism. And it's about doing the best that we can. So first of all, audacious faith. This is about making a decision. 
making a decision, audacious faith. Because Peter here exercises audacious faith. He says, well, look at verse 27. Jesus immediately said to them, take courage when they see that um, he's walking on the water. They think it's a ghost. It is I, don't be afraid. Peter um, says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. Many of us settle for staying in the boat by watching other people taking risks for God. But Peter doesn't settle for staying in the boat. He asks that audacious question. I mean, who would ask a question like that? Lord, if it's you, ask me to come to you on the water. I mean, he is just completely nuts, isn't he? I mean, would you do that? And yet, this is, this is here. This is a story that's here because Peter discovered about discipleship in this story. It's not just courage. It is audacious courage. Audacity means extraordinary courage, extraordinary bravery. Um, what uh, one definition said, schutzpah, which I think is probably used more over the um, other side of the Atlantic than here. But audacity, that extraordinary boldness, that extraordinary courage. And Jesus says to that audacious question, come, come towards me. Come and walk on the water. Come and step out of the boat. Come and take that risk with me. Come and walk towards me. Jesus loves it when we come to him with audacity. And Peter got out of the, wa- wa- got out of the boat and walked on water. And God calls us to live like this. I think so much of the time we, um, we think, oh, uh, that's the extraordinary thing, and Peter and the rest of the disciples are normal. Well, I think they're normal in that they did what everyone else does. But Peter is the one who actually steps out. He is the one who ends up walking on water. And God has called us to live like this. We, we can choose the safe option in our lives of doing church. And we could do that very well. But God has called us to exercise audacious faith. And we've been blessed so much by doing that over the years. What does it actually look like here? Well, um, I heard, I was reading this morning about um, a bishop who was complaining that um, he was uh, trying to um, make you know, the same kind of impact as the early apostles. And he said this, everywhere St. Paul went, there was a riot. Everywhere I go, they serve tea. So we don't want that. (laughs) And we like tea, but we don't want that. What does it look like? Well, it looks like here having a big vision, a big vision big enough for a big God. We don't want to set our sights low. We want to set our sights high. We want to aim high. We want to have that audacious faith that says, we're not going to settle for just doing church. We want to do church that's going to make a difference in our community and in East London. It's about choosing not just to be a disciple, but a disciple who makes disciples. It's stepping out of a private faith and saying, I'm going to make a difference in this world. I'm going to step out and help others to respond to Jesus too. It looks like everyone praying, everyone serving, everyone giving. We've got this opportunity in May, pray in May, to pray together. And um, each Tuesday morning and Friday evening, there are opportunities for us to gather together. Choose one of them this month and just invest in that. Everyone praying. Everyone serving. We, because we've been doing church planting, we've got some gaps in our teams. We want everyone to, um, to play a part in serving in the church and in the community in some way. So, you know, just there'll be an opportunity when we talk about Enjoy It Together to sign up for teams. But there are gaps. Sometimes things are done so well, which is part of what I'll say later on, um, doing things as best as we can, that we think everything, there's no need for anyone to help. Actually, we need people to help all the time. 
There are lots of gaps in our teams, and we'd love you to play a part in that. And giving, everyone giving. At the moment, one third of the church gives regularly. That means two thirds of the church don't give regularly. And actually, audacious faith is about us personally exercising that discipleship decision to give. Giving is good for you. It's good for your soul. That's the first reason for giving. We give because it helps us to be generous. But we also give in church because there's a need for giving. We need to keep going with the church. And if the two-thirds, if more of the two-thirds who don't give, don't give, we can't continue as a church. We want everyone to give. Everyone giving. That's part of audaciously, faithfully living as a disciple. An audacious faith also says that um, we're not going to stop having children, spiritual children, planting churches, just because it's expensive, just because it's difficult, just because it's challenging, because it's exhausting. Those are reasons that we consider, aren't they, when we are thinking about having a family. But when you see the joy of children, that helps us to think, yeah, this is something that is worth doing. It's a wonderful thing. We're going to keep planting churches because we want to keep aiming high because of this kind of audacious faith. Just in one or two minutes, why don't you turn to someone next to you and just um, describe a moment in your own life when you've seen God doing something, when you took a step of faith, when you personally said, I'm going to take a risk for God, I'm going to do something. It might be in your workplace, in your home, in your community, in your life. What's something where you've said, I'm going to take that risk and you've seen God come through for you? It could be small things, it could be big things. Go for it. Just with the people around you, what's something where you've taken a risk for God and he's come through? If you're sitting on your own, do move to um, join a group that's, um, it might be in twos or threes. What's a situation where you've t- taken a step of faith and you've seen God come through?
Okay, just begin to wrap up those conversations. So we want to take account of those situations in our own lives where we've taken that step for God and he's come through. And we want to live like that. We want to live like that in our, in our workplace, in our homes, in our families, in our communities, in, um, in the, the, uh, our relationships with others, to, to live with audacious faith, to say, God, I want to live that kind of life that doesn't settle for staying inside the boat where it's all safe and comfortable, but actually to see you come through um, when, when, excited, when there is exciting possibility of just taking steps of faith, when we share our faith or when we, um, when we need to step out with you know, trusting God for a particular area of our lives in a relationship or money or um, in a job or whatever it is. Living with audacious faith is, is what we see in Peter and the joys and blessings of that as he steps out and actually walks on the water. What that felt like, actually walking on the water. He did it. Living with audacious faith. That's what we want to do as a church. Second um, part of this value of aiming high is um, having relentless optimism. Um, and I want to unpack that a little bit. So um, this, you know, if the first one, of audacious faith, is about a decision, I'm going to decide to live like this, then relentless optimism is about an attitude. Now, I've got a little glass here. Glass of water. That's good. So is that half empty or half full? Okay, let's take a poll. How many people, raise your hands, how, how many people would say that's half full? Okay, how many people would say that's half empty? Uh, how many people are not going to answer? <laughs> so most would say that's half full. Now, um, uh, that's just a laugh, okay, just in terms of the way we um, think about things. But um, I, re- I heard about this um, schoolboy who got this really bad report, and it was just loaded with really bad grades. And his, um, when his father looked at it with, um, with him, his, his dad said, you know, what's all this about? And um, it was probably said a little differently to that. And um, the boy said, um, well, look, Dad, one thing's for sure. At least you know, you know, you can be really proud of me because you know that I wasn't cheating. <laughs> Optimism. Now, in this story, you have to admire Peter's optimism. When um, Jesus is walking across the lake, um, the first experience of the disciples is to think it's a ghost. They are terrified. Verse 26. They're terrified. They cry out in fear. It's a ghost. But Jesus immediately says to them, take courage It is I, don't be afraid, verse 27. So he calms their fears. That's what Jesus does. He calms our fears. But then Peter, with an optimism that we begin to see again and again, a relentless optimism, says, Lord, if it's you, ask me to come to you on the water. Ask me to come. He doesn't say, thank goodness you've arrived, thank goodness it's you, I can't wait for you to get inside the boat. He says, if this is you, let me come to you, walking on the water. And Jesus says, come. And this kind of attitude that Peter has changes the way we live our lives. It changes the way we experience faith. And it's a choice. We need wisdom. We need to calculate it. We need to work out what is going on. On occasions, we will fail. But if failure is always what we focus on, we will never, ever get out of the boat. When you're optimistic, 
you choose to go for it rather than holding back. You know, as a church, I think we've experienced the desire to want to go for it as a church, to want to be optimistic again and again and again. That's the way we've made our decisions. That's the way we've chosen to go about the mission that God has called us to be and to do. And that optimism pervades everything we do as a church. So the whole mood of the church is affected by this optimism, the welcome you get um, uh, when, when you come to church. The, the way um, you, know, you experience uh, the worship, the, the teams, the, um, the teaching, the connect groups, um, you know, our personal lives. Again and again, there's this optimism where we say we want the best. We want to, we want to look at uh, what's possible, what you can do, Lord. I'm not talking about being something that we're not. I'm not talking about covering up um, our failures or only focusing on the positives. I'm talking about relentlessly acknowledging that God is for you and not against you. That God loves you with an everlasting love. That he wants the best for you. That God is a loving and generous father. And he wants his children to be loving and generous. And we have to acknowledge that we fail in so many ways. And we see our failure. But even so, we want to step out of the boat. And we won't accept failure as something that holds us back. But we choose to have another go. We choose to keep trying. We keep, choose to keep on trusting Jesus. You might have heard of Jonas Salk. Jonas Salk was the person who uh, came up with a vaccine for polio. And um, before he came up with that vaccine, he had 200 unsuccessful vaccines. They just didn't, they didn't work. And it takes a long time to do the cultures and do the um, the experiments to in, or, in order to do each one of those vaccine um, experiments. And someone asked him, how did it feel to fail 200 times? And Jonas Salk said this, I didn't fail 200 times. I just found 200 ways how not to vaccinate against polio. Was Jonas Salk a failure? No. I wouldn't say it was a failure. Did Peter fail? Well, yes, in a way, he did fail. His faith was not strong enough. He took his eyes off Jesus. He sank. But there were 11 bigger failures who were in the boat. They stayed there. People rarely criticize their own failure. It's quick to see it in others, isn't it? And only Peter knew what it was to publicly fail in this story. But Peter knew two other things that no one else knew. The first thing he knew was what it was to walk on water. No one else has done that. He walked on water. I don't think he ever forgot that. Once you experience God's power in your life, it changes you, it marks you out forever. And that's something to hunger after, that experience of God that changes you. It's the first thing. The second thing is only Peter knew that when he failed, the right arm of Jesus was strong enough to save him. He knew it because he experienced it. He was sinking, and Jesus reached out and rescued him. What matters is when someone gets out of the boat. You know, he did failure well, if you can fail well. And we want to do failure well here at St. Paul's. 
We want to acknowledge our weaknesses. We want to be quick to say sorry. We want to listen to feedback. We want to choose to change. We want to do that together. We want to do that together, loving and shoving each other towards Jesus. That's what we're about as a church community. We do that because we are relentlessly optimistic. We want to keep on going for it because it's worth it, because that is the prize that's worth grasping. Another moment. Why don't you just turn to your neighbor? Um, this time, not in married couples, because um, you, you're too quick to finish. So turn to someone else, and I'd like you to just talk about a moment of failure in your life where actually it's been a blessing to you. Something's gone wrong, and actually you're so glad in hindsight that you learned something from it or something changed because of that and that you're a better person for it. Whatever it is, describe a moment where you failed and it's actually turned out to be a good thing. Go for it. And just begin to bring those to a close. So um, I have failed on numerous occasions in my life. But one of the most significant failures um, for me was um, at the end of my school career. So I had taken an extra term at school to study for um, Oxford and Cambridge entrance exams. And I'd set my heart on going to Cambridge University and basically I failed the exam. And all the plans that I had laid out in front of me just evaporated. And I was absolutely devastated. And I was kind of processed, processing this for quite a while, for um, um, almost a year. I went to my second choice of university, which was Birmingham University. And three weeks into the term, um, I met a friend of Louis, who Louis had led to Christ. And she invited me to go to church. And at the church where I went, I became a Christian. And... As I began to reflect on that over the following months and years, I've come to see that as being probably the greatest blessing that could ever have happened to me by not going to Cambridge. And I think I would have just been an arrogant, stuck-up, what's it, if I, not that people are from there, but actually I would have been. <laughs> I would have been. There's some great people who, um, who study there, but I, I would have been a nightmare for me. <laughs> Trying to dig myself out of that one. <laughs> Because I, I know me. I know how I would have reacted. And God changed my life because of that, that failure. And actually, that's, um, God uses failure. He uses the way we can just keep on going because we make a choice. We say, I'm going to go for it with God. I'm going to choose, no matter what happens, no matter how um, 
far I fall, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. Relentless optimism. That's what's behind those words. Third thing um, in aiming high is doing the best that we can. And we do this um, as a church. Note, I haven't put excellence there because I think excellence doesn't allow for failure. But doing the best we can says, you know something? We won't, we'll get it wrong sometimes, but actually we, our aim is to aim high. We want to do things the best way we can. This is about taking action. If that's about a decision, audacious faith. If that's about an attitude, relentless optimism, doing the best we can is about action. Peter's response um, to walking on water, to sinking and being saved by Jesus was, look at verse 33. Those who were with him in the boat worshipped him saying, truly, you are the Son of God. This event didn't stop Peter from following Jesus. It emboldened him to follow Jesus all the more. And so that's why we choose to go for it, doing the best that we can. Water walkers, that's what God calls us to be. Water walkers like you and me, instead of comfort, we're going to go for growth. Instead of staying in the boat, we're going to, um, you know, plumbing for a life less ordinary. We're going to step out and go for something with audacious faith. Instead of settling for okay, we're going to do the best that we can. That will be reflected in everything that we do. So the welcome, we want to do the best welcome we can. We want to have the best coffee that we can. We want to have the best worship. And these, the worship is amazing here because Andrew embodies this value of doing the best that he can. The um, admin staff and the, the engine room, what we call the engine room, the kind of back workings of the church, they are amazing. They do the best they can and they are phenomenal with what they're able to achieve. What I see the connect group leaders doing the best they can, they're fantastic leaders. The um, leaders of teams, they're just fantastic because they do the best they can. The people on the service teams, the people in the children's church right now, they're doing the best they can. They're throwing themselves into serving with um, relentless optimism and audacious faith. That's the way we want to live. We want to do the best we can. I think it means we want to do the best we can in our discipleship, the way we love God, the best we can in our worship. We want to throw ourselves um, at God. Say, Lord, I want to love you with all my heart. If I don't sometimes feel like that, I'm still going to do it. The way we love um, one another in this church community, the best we can. Learning to love each other, learning to be there for one another. We, we need to learn that. That's, but that's what we aspire to. And loving our neighbors the best we can. Beginning to take those steps of faith saying, would you like to come to our connect group or would you like me to, um, can I help you in any way? Um, are there things that I can do to be a blessing to you? So, water walkers, which is what God calls us to be, aim high. We're called to live with an audacious faith, to be relentlessly optimistic, say, I'm going to go for God. I'm going to go for it, go for him with every part of my being. And I'm going to do the best that I can in everything that I put my mind to. That's what God's called us to be as a community, to aim high. I think that's what God calls us to do as individual Christians, as individual disciples, to aim high in everything that we do. Children are just some arriving for communion. And in communion, I want to encourage us to affirm these things, to come to Jesus and say, Lord, here I am. I'm, gonna, I'm going to aim high with my life. And I'm going to aim high in the way that um, I'm involved in this church. I'm going to aim high in the way I support what is going on in this church. Amen? Amen. Would you like to stand?